Good morning, everybody. Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We're in the season of Easter, not just Easter Sunday, the season of Easter where we are reminded that Christ is alive and at work in the world, uh, and we are continually called to respond to that, to live as if God is alive and at work in the world. So welcome on this second Sunday in Easter. Uh, we're going to begin this morning with our gathering song, a little unconventional. We're going to go camp song-ish a little bit. This was my idea, so if it goes really poorly, it's not Sammy's fault whatsoever. But our, but our, our Old Testament reading is Psalm 133, which is about uh, unity. It's uh, set, it, kind of the cultural moment behind it is this moment of transition, the death of a father and a family. In this moment when everyone might vie for primary position. And so it says, Behold, how good and how pleasing. So in Hebrew, we're going to sing in Hebrew today. So it's hine, means behold, matov, how good. And then you, that's the only part you have to know. Hine matov. And then umanaim, how pleasing it is when brothers dwell together yachad as one, not in competition or pulling apart or, or fighting, but to dwell together as one. So here's the part. Hinema tov, and you're going to sing, Hinema tov. Can you do that? Hinema tov. And here comes a really hard lyric. Lai, 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 lai. <laughs> all right? That's all you got to know right there. So I'm going to say, Hine Matov, Hine Matov, Lai, 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 Hine Matov, Umanaim, Shevet Achim, Gam Yachad, Hine Matov, Hine Matov, Lai, 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 Hine matov, hine matov. Lai, 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 lai. How good and how pleasing it is when we dwell together as one. Let's join in our call to worship. This is the good news which we proclaim to you. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Yeah, let's all stand together. <laughs> O oh, church, walk in the light of his love. Live in the light of his teachings and healing mercies. Come, let us worship the one who overcame death. Let us celebrate the triumph of our Lord. Amen. Let's sing.
You may be seated. Join with me in our prayer of confession. Let's pray. Patient Lord, you wait for us to understand. You wait for us to remove the blinders of fear, unbelief, confusion. You have offered to us the greatest miracle of all time, the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. We sang and celebrated last Sunday, but a week has passed and we have slid back into our old rhythms and patterns, not stepping into or more fully realizing your resurrection power and love. Shake us up, Lord. Shake us up and cause us to look with new eyes on our Savior, who came that we might have life abundantly, serving all who are in need. Forgive our stubbornness and our complacency. Reach out to us so that we may reach out with healing love to others. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us hear our words of assurance. Let the stone of ignorance, stubbornness, and fear be rolled away from your heart. Celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No. Let's sing our response. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship. May the peace of Christ be with you. We're going to hear from the choir now.
call attention to a couple of announcements. Uh, one is at one o'clock this afternoon will be the memorial service for Jim Strange and invite you all to come back and participate in that. Uh, we are going to be setting up, there'll be a meal after that, so we're going to be setting up tables right after the service. So if you're able-bodied and uh, time uh, available, we'd appreciate a little help to pull some tables out and get the room set up uh, so that we'll all sit around the tables for our service and then have the meal afterwards. Uh, and Liz is uh, coordinating all that, so if there's extra, if you want to help in any way, you can talk to Liz also for the meal. Um, Otherwise, I wanted to just call Marsha Grass is our new office administrator, and she has worked with Sherry the last couple of weeks in learning the things of the office. So she's been in the fire hose phase of learning a new role, uh, but not long enough to really kind of figure it all out. So she'll be in that phase for a while. Complicated is that she has surgery this week. So we can pray for Marsha this morning too. She has a blocked uh, tear duct in one of her eyes. So apparently that's a bit of a gross procedure. So we'll pray for her that that all goes straight forward this week. And then she'll be in the office full time or on a regular basis the week after. So all that to say is you can see some of our things are out of place in the bulletin. We're, you know, one of our scans needs a micro magnifying glass, you know. So, well, she'll need some loving support in figuring out all the little things. As we've said when we've interviewed folks for that job, is that it's not a lot of any one thing, but it's a lot of little things. So she'll be take some time to learn all the little things, but she's a, a great person and very uh, lovely demeanor and a hard worker, so I trust that she will be, we believe she's the right fit, but it's going to take her some time to figure that out. So uh, other announcements that need to be made? Sandy? All right, thanks, Sandy. Sandy says there is a sign-up sheet on the whiteboard out there if you would like to help participate in gardening for God, maintaining flower beds over at the Pace Center. Steve? I thought to John Kuhlman Thursday, Friday, one day. He's headed back to see his granddaughter, but he's headed to say hi to everyone. All right, John Kuhlman sends his greetings. Good. Any other announcements? Yes. Hey, come on over. Good morning. Um, I'm doing this in lieu of Pastor Tom because he's not able to be with us this morning. But uh, I went to Step 7 service yesterday, which meets right here, and uh, he asked me to announce that Eric genius will be with uh, step seven next Saturday morning at 1030. Um, Mr. Genius is a performer of original piano works and uh, he is noted for concerts for hope and he performs in prisons, hospitals, nursing homes, and um, he heard about Step 7 somehow, and uh, Pastor Tom said he spent a lot of time with uh, Mr. Genius on Friday on the telephone setting up for uh, a, a concert next Saturday morning at 10.30 at Step 7. And um, I think that's all I was supposed to tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other announcements? Linda? Um, Harold Higgins called the other night and he said that, that um, they're going to be moving, selling their home and moving to another place, but I don't think they know where yet. That they yeah. know assisted living or maybe an apartment, I don't know. <laughs> but even if we can pray for their safety or another side of it. Uh, thank you, Linda. We'll transition to our time of prayers. Please join me in prayer. God, we are so blessed and grateful that we have this place to come to, these people 
to celebrate with, and to grieve with. These people to support us during difficult times. These people who help us to smile when we are down, to laugh when we need to laugh, and God, to give us a hug when it feels like there's nothing going right in our lives. We are blessed and grateful. We are grateful that we have that chance. And we are grateful for this opportunity to share with each other the joys and concerns that fill our lives. And God, we pray that you would be with each of us. You know the joys and the concerns in each of these lives and in each of these moments. And God, we pray that you would be with them that you would comfort them and strengthen them with it where it is needed, that you would help them to experience every second of the joy where that is appropriate. And God, we pray that you would be with them through each of their days. And God, we pray that you would be with each of us as we go through our days. As spring comes again and we start to feel the pushing and the growing and the days get longer, we pray that you would be with us, that you would help us to celebrate the new life, the new life of Easter, that you have given to each of us, the promise that through you, we can have eternal life. God, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So April is National Poetry Month, and our poem today is written by Ada Limon, and Ada Limon is the current Poet Laureate of the United States. She's the 53rd Poet Laureate of the United States. The first Poet Laureate was appointed in 1937. Poet Laureates these days serve two-year terms, but originally they only served one-year terms. Miss Limon brings her own wonderful poetry to a long line of gifted poets, many of which we have heard from in our services. Robert Lowell, who served from 1947 to 48, Robert Faust from 1958 to 59, Louis Untermeyer from 1961 to 1963, Billy Collins from 2001 to 2003, and Natasha Trethewey from 2012 to 2014. This is Ada Limon's poem, Instructions on Not Giving Up. More than the fuchsia funnels breaking out of the crab apple tree, more than the neighbor's almost obscene display of cherry limbs shoving their cotton candy colored blossoms to the slate sky of spring rains. It's the greening of the trees that really gets to me. When all the shock of white and taffy, the world's baubles and trinkets have the pavement strewn with the confetti of aftermath, then the leaves come, patient, plodding, a green skin growing over whatever winter did to us, a return to the strange idea of continuous living despite the mess of us, the hurt, the empty. Fine then, I'll take it, the trees seem to say, a new slick leaf unfurling like a fist to an open palm. I'll take it all. Please attend the prayer for illumination. Loving God, as we listen to the words in your book, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to those words, that you would use them to guide us in the coming week and to open us to the words of the sermon. In your name we pray, amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Psalm 133. We already know a little bit about this, thanks to Pastor Dave's camp song this morning. So... But Psalm 133 is it about unity and about being together. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing. Live forevermore. And our New Testament reading this morning comes from John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. I always think of this as Peter's redemption. Peter. 
After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathanael of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord. He put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, He said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death with which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. John, excuse me, John 21 is one of my favorite gospel stories. In fact, I looked back through my files this week and noticed that I've preached on this passage quite a few times over the years, always right after Easter. This fact suggests that I probably don't have anything new to say about this passage, but it is one of my favorite stories for a couple of reasons. One, it involves fishing. And two, it involves that moment of recalibrating and renegotiating that is part of growing up, part of adapting and maturing, part of deepening our experiences and commitments after we go through difficult times. For this moment after Easter, it's a transition point, a natural transition point, a point when it would be feasible and easy for many of the disciples to walk away. A moment between contracts of sorts, when you have an easy out. People came to follow Jesus for many reasons over the time of his ministry. His miracles, his teachings, his attention to those who were marginalized or pushed to the side by a religious culture that determined some clean and others unclean, some of the right blood and others not. People followed Jesus for many reasons. But the twelve... The main group we hear so much about, including Peter and these others who've gone fishing in our story this morning, they were all invited with a special call 
Jesus invites them to leave their vocations and their trajectories to follow him in a particularly intense way. He invited them to be his students and to, to follow along in his ministry, to be part of this messianic vision. They followed for many reasons, but none of them anticipated the events of Holy Week. No one believed their beloved leader was going to die that way, to suffer in that way. And certainly no one, even if they were told in advance, expected he would rise again. And so they, on this morning, when they're gone fishing, you can see them. I can just picture him a little bit ragged, a little bit worn down, tired. They've been through an intense moment, traumatic even. They came face to face with the threats of violence, power that has the authority to sentence one to death. They saw their leader suffer and die, went through that initial stage of mourning and grief, and now all of a sudden they're grappling with Jesus being alive and what it all means. Yes, it all went very differently than they expected. And certainly what they had known has now changed. And whatever the future is, it's going to feel different on a day-to-day -day level than what they've been living. It's a natural point to step back, to step out even, to reconsider what, whether they even want to continue in this path. And Peter's response is, I'm going fishing. And the others say, well, that's a good idea. We'll go also. Why fishing, we may wonder. Now, I've often said that fishing for the disciples is not what you do on your day off. It's different than when I go fishing. For them, it's, it's how they grew up learning how to pay the bills. It was a vocation. It was their childhood roots. It was the familiar rhythm of grabbing the nets and knowing what to do in your body before your mind even has a chance to think about it. It was their life before Jesus came on the scene their vocation until Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And I do wonder if for the disciples, they think that this ministry and messianic project is done. That they're figuring out what is next. Or maybe Peter and the others are just discouraged and do not see themselves at the heart of Jesus' work anymore. It is a transition point when they could easily walk away this is all possible, all possible for reasons for why they are back in their home area, back in their old boats, back in the old business. I think there's something to that. But I was also thinking more about it, thinking about being back on the water, back in the boat, back in the flow, the currents, the rippling sound of water tickling against the boat. It's a place where one goes to process to get relief, to clear one's head amidst the rocking motion of the water. There's a certain physicality to it. Like going for a walk or doing something with your hands. There is a way of getting space and processing by not having to focus on the thing itself full force. Maybe that's why they go fishing. See, Peter was among the most fervent of the disciples. He had proclaimed that he would follow to the death, even if everyone else fell away. He was always the first to jump in, literally and figuratively. He was the most eager, the most committed, the most wear your emotions on your sleeve kind of guy. He was not the type to discourage or give up easily. So perhaps he is like the canary in the coal mine. If Peter is questioning... If Peter is wondering if this is all worth it, then maybe the rest are also. And maybe that's why Peter is the focus again in this story. It was a transition point, a point when they could have easily moved on to something else. And so it is interesting that John, the gospel writer, orders his gospel in a particular way. For John is telling us the story of a miraculous catch of fish which Luke also tells us about. Luke talks about a miraculous catch of fish, but Luke tells that story in the beginning of his gospel. John, for John, the real moment of call comes now, in the moment when they could easily walk away, when they have a clear picture of what it means to follow, 
of what it might cost or the faith it might require, it is at this juncture when Jesus calls them to leave their nets and to follow. And just as the nets become bursting with fish, as the story goes on in Acts, we learn that the church becomes bursting with these new believers. It would have been an unfortunate moment for Peter and the others to walk away. But it is interesting that John has Jesus calling the disciples to leave their nets and follow after a miraculous catch, not when they are fresh and wide-eyed, but after they have been through the harrowing journey of Holy Week. That's the recalibrating part. The negotiating after you have a better picture of what this is all about. Will you leave the nets then, now that you know more? Will you still follow and let go of the familiar and the comfortable and step out? I'm aware this morning as I preach on John 21 again, as I'm sure you all are, that next Sunday is my last Sunday with you all, that we are in our own time of transition. And over the years of this church, things haven't always gone as expected. Old plans of buying property and building buildings and having a building full of kids and young families, they've morphed into other plans. Things didn't work out as expected. Ministry has emerged differently and there are challenges moving forward, navigating the future. And these are some of the reasons to my stepping down so that you have the room and freedom to explore other avenues that are more financially viable. But the fact is, is it creates a lot of transition, a lot of points when it would be easy to pull back or to pull away, to say, yeah, this is a good time to stop. I relate to the impulse to go fishing after such a moment, after an intense season or event, to fall into a familiar embodied rhythm as one takes a deep breath. In fact, I plan to go fishing on the week of April 15th, and actually again on May 1st, taking some time before I decide on what is next. For me, I relate to the impulse to go fishing, and I also relate to that moment of processing of recalibrating the call and commitment of our lives. We sometimes have to take a breath, a moment, before we dive in again. And so John records this miraculous catch of fish, as Luke does, but he also tells us of this breakfast scene, which is not in any of the other Gospels. Jesus cooks them breakfast on the shore. And as they sit, Jesus asks Peter a question the force of which is probably all in the delivery and the intonation. Because it could come off like, oh, hey, big shot, you thought you loved me more than everybody else. How's it going now? It's probably not how it comes off, though, is it? You could have rubbed it in Peter's face, but I think the intonation Jesus is using here is more tender and gentle, perhaps. Jesus is affirming who he knows Peter to be the leader he has always been and is capable of being, coaxing out the heart and the spirit of Peter again. Yes, we all need time to process and to recalibrate. But we also have to get back to our hearts. Back to that call placed on our lives again. And so Jesus does that with Peter. Do you love me more than these still, Peter? Peter had boasted that. Even if all fall away, he would not. Peter's fervency and love was such that all the gospel writers tell of it. And Jesus' question seems to be more penetrating, a question of a friend seeking to restore Peter. Do you love me more than these? And Peter's response is not full of the confidence he once had. But he responds, yes, Jesus, you know that I love you. Three times Jesus asked the question to match the three times Peter denied knowing him. Three questions around a charcoal fire. That's the detail John gives us. A detail that links back to the charcoal fire in the courtyard when Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. Each time Jesus issues the call, feed my sheep. 
tend my lambs. And notice Jesus doesn't offer any platitudes of encouragement. He doesn't say, oh, don't worry about it, Peter. It's just one time. I'm sure this will never happen again. Nothing like this. It'll all be fine. Don't worry. I'm sure everything will go according to plan in the future. Now, Jesus doesn't offer any shallow comforts. He asks only, do you love me? And he issues the call, feed my lambs. It's a sober moment there in the quiet of the morning by the crackling of the fire after so much had transpired. A moment of calling, asking Peter to leave the world of fishing again, to come follow and to come serve. In this season of transition, I am going fishing, and I encourage you to engage whatever activity you have that helps you take a deep breath process and recalibrate. And then after that, I hope you'll sit down to breakfast, whether it's fish over an open fire or something else, that's all up to you. But I hope you will hear Jesus's question again, addressed not just to Peter, but to you in your name. Things may change and evolve in ways we didn't expect, but I'm pretty confident that the call to follow Christ does not have an expiration date though it does have periods of renewal. The call will come again asking you, do you love me? And will you serve? The call will come again. It will. But for now, let's go fishing. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand as you're able and let's sing our hymn. Right before our passage today, John records the story of Jesus appearing to the disciples in those moments after Jesus had risen. risen. And uh, where are they? They're, they're in a room, locked away in fear. And Jesus is with them, and then he goes away, and then he comes back. And then we have the story of Thomas, and then he breaks bread with them again, and they recognize that, that he had done that before. And this becomes the meal by which we, we reconnect with and remember Christ's love for his disciples and for us, for his broken body and poured out blood, that we might stay connected to Christ's grace, and this is one way in which we do it, coming together around this table Remembering the night in which he was betrayed, he said to them, this is my body, broken for you. Eat of it as often as you do, and remember me. And we take of the cup, to which Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it as often as you do, in remembrance of me. 
And so in a moment, as Sammy plays, we invite you to, to come forward, to take a piece of bread and a cup and return to your seat, and we'll all participate together in a way of remembering that involves not just our minds, but our bodies, to take it in, take in Christ's broken body and pour it out blood for you, even as his disciples did. Uh, if you need someone to bring uh, elements to you, please just raise your hand. There is gluten-free in the center. Thank you. Let us take our bread together, the body of Christ, broken for us all. Thanks be to God. And let us take our cup, the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God. Would you join with me in our prayer of response? Let us pray together. O oh God, who has so greatly loved us, long sought us, and mercifully redeemed us, give us grace that in everything we may yield ourselves, our wills and our works, as a continual thank offering to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
You may be seated. As we go this morning, I invite you to place your tithes and offerings in the offering box on the back table. Let us pray. Lord, receive the gifts that we have to offer you today, gifts of time and energy, of heart, of, of gifts, of strength, of finances. Lord, receive what we have to offer and use it for your work here among us and around the world and use it to continue to grow us as your disciples, willing and able to follow you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go today in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Creator, and the fellowship of the Spirit with us now and forevermore. Amen.